Kerry County Council, Kerry Arts, Forest McGill, um, Elaine McGill talked RTE and our associate sponsor, Dean of Distillery. Um, before I hand over to Sarah, I just wanted to say, Sarah is one of the most amazing um, Irish novelists around. I've read um, all her work and it's, they are fantastic, so I would urge you if you haven't read her books. Shortlisted for the Costa um, Award, the Guardian Award, and uh, won the Geoffrey Faber Memorial Award. And um, I haven't read Seven Steeples yet, but I, I've heard a couple of people say that it's absolutely fantastic. So good luck with that. It's published next spring. So um, hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Um, well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's almost an out of body experience for me anyway now at this stage. <laughs> um, uh, Carlo Gebler really needs very little by way of introduction, I think, especially to um, the people in this room. Um, uh, or perhaps the way of putting it is that there's no introduction quite capacious enough to yeah. encompass <laughs> all of the publications and achievements and um, uh, literary in endeavours and adventures, let's say, um, over the past uh, any number of years. <laughs> Hundred. Hundred. Um, he's a member of Ace Dawner. Uh, he's in intensely prolific, and in the last, I suppose, three, two years, um, he's published uh, Aesop's Fables, The Cruelty of the Gods, Tales We Tell Ourselves, a selection from the Decameron, that was just last year, I think, and I Antigone, which is the book we'll be talking about here today, um, all retellings of ancient stories. Um, uh, I have here a novelist, biographer, playwright, memoirist, critic, and occasional broadcaster, and it's also incredibly important to say uh, teacher. Um, Carlo has taught in prisons for about the last 20 years. I'm it? still in prison still since in prison. 1991. And he also taught me, though not in prison. No. <laughs> he taught me in the um, Oscar Wilde Center uh, mm -hmm. doing my creative, write of, creative writing masters in Trinity College, Dublin in, I think, 2010. Um, yeah. And last year, as part of the Dingle Literary Festival, he interviewed me about my third book, Handiwork. And um, we, this was obviously online. So um, Carlo was in Ellis, Ennis Gillen and I was in Skibbereen, and I think he said at the end, you know, or, or probably we both said it would be lovely to sit down together um, in the future, and I said, and, and at that time we can turn the tables and I can interview you, and, uh, and so here we are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, and what a pleasure. So the room in which, the room in the Oscar Wilde Centre, where, where, where all the teaching takes place, is the room underneath where Oscar was born. Yes, which I'm sure is, you which told is, us that then, in yeah, fact. Well, <laughs> And, and, and I always make people sit in the same place. So Sarah, all, because she chose as her seat on the first day, the one directly in front of me. So, and you know, you teach outwards. So you were the person I was, I was addressing for that term. Hence, hence my, my achievements thus. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I wasn't gonna, thank you, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, well, I need to start this with a confession, because when I offered, or when I invited myself, I suppose, back to Dingle to interview you on your novel, your forthcoming novel, I suppose it was probably written at the time. No, it was being written at the being time. Written. But yeah. um, anyway, I did not know and had no way of knowing that it would be a retelling of Greek myth. Um, and I must admit that when, um, when I realized that, I thought, oh no, <laughs> um, because my, my, my grasp of Greek myth, I suppose, is patchy is very much um, kind of comes from, gleaned from popular culture, something I realized now as I was reading it. Um, and so my first dilemma on picking up the book was, and don't be horrified, do I Google things beforehand? Or do I, and then read the book? Or do I read the book and then Google things afterwards? <laughs> I would Google first. Always go to Dr. Google. Yeah. Why do you think, um, I mean, in popular culture, the classics live on a bit, a bit. But why have, why has all that wealth, do you think, kind of, why is it not um, central to the educational system? Well, that, I mean, I can only imagine that, and, and this is one of the reasons I thought I'm a bad person for this, because I fear that my, my grasp of Greek myth is worse than the average person, because I never studied anything academic at college. So I have this presumption that most people do know more than me, <laughs> but perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm sure you're wrong. <laughs> well, anyway, it, it didn't matter. You're, you're right. I did Google it first. And I mean, on the back, it mentioned Sophocles and the Thebian plays and Oedipus. So I had, obviously, I wasn't trying to cover the, the, entire, um, the entire story of ancient Greece. Mm. Um, but, uh, 
but then I, at times I slightly regretted knowing what was coming. Ah. Um, and, and felt at the end that I really didn't need to have known anything at all, that it's just a wonderfully told story um, about themes that are universal mm. um, and that it would have carried me had I not known, mm. you know, had I not known that mm. ancient Greece had existed at all. Mm. Well, that, yes. Um, well, I mean, both of my parents were writers and um, you absorb osmotically or unconsciously values and one of the values that they um, prolongated, and I was going to say preached, but you never heard them say this, was the idea that everything must be accessible. No, no impediment to the uploading and the imbibing and the absorption of literary culture must be allowed to exist. So your job as a writer is to organize the content so that people acquire the knowledge they need to know get the names, get the facts, get the backstory. And yeah, that was, that was there. And, and that connected, I now, I didn't understand at the time, I now understand, particularly in my father's case, but in my mother's case as well, connected to their politics, mm. which were that uh, culture is for everybody. Yeah. Yes, and Greek culture, which is, I mean, as I read it, I, I think I said to Mark, my partner, several times, Oh, I get it now. I get the whole fuss thing about Greek myth. <laughs> and, and the fuss was, essentially, it's, it's the earliest set of stories that we have written down. Yeah. Um, and these, uh, that's fiction, um, you know, even though it, it, it might not be fiction, um, that have repeated over and over and over again. It's, it's really the cradle of all literary culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 I mean the, the Sophocles and the Theban plays, there's um, Aeschylus, um, and then there's Homer, and there's Lesbos. So there is, and then after them there's Herodotus and various, and you know, Seneca and various Romans mm -hmm. who built on these people. But yeah, they are the, they are the, they are, they are pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, and now these were, these, these would have been composed, the original Greek myths, the, the original Sophoclean story would have existed um, as something that was remembered and retold. And then Sophocles um, produced his three Theban plays, and they were written down. I don't know whether they were written down at the moment he composed them, or whether they were written down by the, whether the actors who had learned them, they then declaimed to them and it was then transcribed. I'm not quite certain about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's just on the cusp of the movement from the oral to the to the written. Mm -hmm. um, and they're written as plays. They, yes. Were they written in They were written accurate. as, yes, you, the, it'll say things Stage like, um, yeah, it, it, you know, all of um, Oedipus Rex, which is the first of the three Theban plays, it takes place in front of the palace in Thebes, and Jocasta comes out. Jocasta goes, or sort of comes out and goes in. Ditto, Oedipus. And yes, there's absolute uh, fidelity to the idea of creating a realistic um, play. Mm -hmm. So it's a watch mechanism, and it has to keep time, and it has to take place over a set period of time, mm -hmm. and it has to be credible. It actually takes place over the course of a day, but yeah. So they were trying to trying to be realistic. Actually, not trying. Were realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but so much is left out then, in that that comes into prose. You know, you're telling it as prose narrative. Yeah, because um, yeah, the story of Oedipus, which exists in the play, which the audience who would have seen the play or the Theban plays would have brought to the performance is much more complicated than the version provided in the play. In the play, very simply, Oedipus, for various reasons, outs himself as the killer of Laius, his wife Jocasta's first husband, and as a man who is in an incestuous union because he is married to Jocasta, who is also his mother. Basically, that's what happens in it. But what people would have known, which isn't in the play, 
is that Laius, whom Oedipus is the son of and whom Oedipus has killed, murdered in a rage, without knowing he was his father, he has a huge complicated backstory. Mm. And, his, and, and then behind that is the backstory of Thebes, Cadmus. Ooh, shall I close the door? <laughs> That's the ghost. This of is the ghost of yeah. <laughs> Oedipus. Oh, it's the window. Shall I just leave it open? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, and so the, um, the 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 the. In order to under what I what I realised looking at the story was that, what was really interesting was, Jocasta's fate. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she she had a rough time. She boy, did she have a rough time. <laughs> And she gets the least lines in the play. Oh, okay. But is probably the most, uh, talks the best sense. Because mm. Jocasta's counsel is, don't look under the stone. Mm. Don't stir things up. Because Jocasta knows. Mm. Also doesn't know. But she's got a pretty, she, she would have, a, she would, no, well, she, would, she has a sense of what might have happened, but she, i.e. that the man that she's married to has killed her husband and that she's now married to the man who murdered her husband. She might, she sensed, I, I feel that she sensed that if she chose to delve, she would discover that, but she chooses not to delve. Um, she suffers a lot and has very little choice in matters. Um, and is constantly subject to the will of others. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And which can be said of really most characters, apart from a couple of powerful men. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> um, apart from Laius, perhaps. Well, Laius um, is. Everyone is suffering for someone else's mistakes. Yeah, but Laius is also suffering because he is he is the he, he has raped Chrysippus. Oh, well, yes, but he did do that. Himself. He did do that of his own accord. <laughs> so Laius is brought up in in a in a foreign court and. Um, he falls in love with one of the sons of the king who, he's, who with whom he grows up, who's younger than him, and he, he rapes him. And then he brings him to Thebes and Chrysippus kills himself. And the Chrysippus story is very, very famous and there's the most beautiful um, visual representation of Chrysippus's life and death. Oh, where's that? Um, well, on right. statuary that I've seen photographs of that are in various museums. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, that was actually something I wondered at, about because having a, having a poor grasp of Greek myth, the thing that fascinated me most was the minor characters, really. Mm. Um, and I mean, they weren't minor characters, they became major characters, but they were essentially um, what, what we think of as like the henchmen, you know. Um, if I'm to compare it to like dramas that I watch on Netflix, you know, there's all of these sort of disposable <laughs> characters along yeah. the way that you know they're going to die as soon as they walk into the frame kind of thing. Um, and I mean, really like um, uh, Chrysippus, I would have definitely pronounced that one wrong, um, uh, Calidice, um, yeah. who's uh, Jocasta's maid, and then um, her Laundry son. Laundry maid. Laundry maid, yeah. yes, um, yeah, crucial. Uh, some some very uh, interesting details about um, laundry in Greek times in ancient Greece, um, and then her son, who is the shepherd. Um, uh, these were all very, you know, small uh, bit parts essentially, and people who have absolutely no no free will, um, and and yet they were the ones that fascinated me. Um, that they were they were the people whose side that I was on, really. They're the um, little people. Though I knew that they were going to perish as well in a way as well. Oh, you know? Calidice and. And uh, Antimedes, her son, their fates are they're absolutely terrible. But the, um, Antimedes, who is, who's just simply called the shepherd in, in Sophocles' play, he is, he is the spindle around which the whole uh, narrative turns. Because he is the poor sap whom Laius says, well, actually, it's Jocasta, or Laius and Jocasta together. Here's a baby. It's Oedipus. Take him to the mountain and leave him to die. They're not prepared to do that, and they have to do that because the um, the Delphic Oracle has told Laius that this child will grow up and mm -hmm. kill him. But but they don't know that either, so they don't know what they're doing. They when Laius, they choose to save the baby. Yeah, the Antimedes shepherd, doesn't. Yeah, and no. Antimedes doesn't know it now. Mm -hmm. So off he goes with the baby to the slopes of Sitheron, thinking, oh, 
I leave this baby to die, I'm going to be cursed. You're not meant to. So he gives the baby to someone else who brings it to Corinth, and the baby grows up to be Oedipus. And he goes back to Thebes, and then he sort of rises socially, and he becomes Laius's sort of butler, grand. Then there's a new catastrophe, and Laius is going off to consult the oracle in Delphi again as to how to deal with this catastrophe, and he has the shepherd, Antonides, with him. And that's when they meet Oedipus, and that's when Oedipus mm. kills Laius. And Antonides, he knows who that man is. Because he knows, he's been told when he was given the baby, he's got all the information. And he just zips it and goes back onto the slopes. But in the end, he's outed, and they find him, and, and they kill him. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody gets killed. Everybody, everybody, <laughs> yes, it's very... Or kills themselves. Yeah, because you don't have... Because what's in, what interested me about the story is, is that you've got... Um, uh, in, in, in the world now, particularly, we decide to do everything... We, 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 we do decide to do what we decide to do. And at the same time, our decision to do what we decide to do feels completely... Um, feels like something that we haven't decided on, but it's imposed on us. We're tricked, we're lied to, we're finagled, whatever. So we are simultaneously free and unfree. And that's what I thought the story was about. And it seems like a good time to ask perhaps the obvious question, why this book now? Why this retelling? Um... Because the world is in just such a terrible state. Uh, this was written during the pandemic, was it? A bit. Yeah. Quite quickly? No, actually, the honest truth, mm. I've been thinking about writing something about... Originally, I thought I was going to write an, a little operetta, you know, as one does, <laughs> about the shepherd. And I thought, it, I'm just going to write, and I'm going to have the shepherd and the man from Corinth who takes Oedipus as a baby, and the two of them, and they've been caught, and they're going to be killed. And I thought, a little operetta with the two of them talking. And the man from Corinth saying, oh, holy moly, you've really stuck me in it now. And Antimedes, the Theban shepherd, saying, why did you, you, you know, it's all your fault for taking the baby to Corinth and giving him to the king. Mm. And then I thought, you know, I looked into the story a bit more and I thought, oh, no. Where does Antimedes come from? He must have a mother. Ooh, mm. she must be Jocasta's maid. Ooh. Yeah. Where does Jocasta come from? Oh, she's one of the Sown Men's descendants. Yes, yeah. Oh, who are they? They were part of the foundation of Thebes. Oh, how was Thebes founded? And then you go back to Europa. Because mm. the other thing about the whole story is Europa, from which Europe takes its name, is the much put upon queen who really invents she is raped by Zeus, and Zeus, well, it's not contrition. He offers her something, and she picks law as what she will have back, and her sons will be judges in Hades. And from that, there is the idea that the, the law, the idea that you have something that is separate from people, that is impartial and uncorrupt and honest, um, is derived, mm. it is said. And yet it's important to say that the entire book is a narrated by Antigone. It's essentially an Antigone's voice. Mm. And I was surprised to find that she really, her story sort of begins at the end in a way. She has um, a terrible time as well. Well, <laughs> I, I googled that too, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> Antigone, get, Antigone has an awful time as well. Yeah. But why choose her voice? Ah. Because it was essentially Oedipus' story. Uh, that's because um, as you age, <laughs> you become more interested in non-fiction. Mm. And um, 
So more and more and more, I find myself thinking, really, the, the, the literary art that I am at the moment, as I have aged, most interested in and most involved with is biography. Now, I, I was uh, when I was finishing this, I, I read Boswell's Life of Johnson. But I had been thinking about that. I'd been thinking about Ditton Strachey's Eminent Victorians. I've been thinking about Michael Holroyd's biographies of Shaw, Lytton Strachey, Augustus John, et al., and back. And there's something about one person narrating the life of another person that I find beautiful. It's a perfect mechanism. It really makes sense. And when the person doing the narrating is also invested mm -hmm. in presenting an account of the subject arising from their own experience of the subject, like Boswell does with Johnson, then you've really got something that takes off. Mm -hmm. So Antigone's line is her father has, well, he's just known as the you know, father murderer, uh, mar mother marrier. Mm -hmm. you know, his, his reputation is, has been traduced. And what she wants to do is bring to the attention of the world that this was none of his own doing. He did all. He did everything that is said, but it wasn't of his own doing, and people need to bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, she is the great um, prolongator of nuance and intelligence, and you look very carefully and you understand what you're being. Don't don't judge. Mm -hmm. Don't don't react. Don't d let rage take you over. Look at things, and you will understand as she argues, if you look at the case of Oedipus, that none of what happened was of his own devising. And that connects with Europa and the idea of the law. We, we, need, to, we need to know, we need to, we, 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 well, we need to be intelligent and open, as opposed to closed and judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, so she, the, the story is, is that she goes into exile with her father, as she did, and then Hermes appears and tells her father everything because he doesn't know and he tells his daughter and then Hermes takes him away to death and she transcribes that she dictates to a scribe who transcribes everything back in Thebes but this is taking place within the context of the civil war that's covered in the third Theban play and um, Polynices and Eteocles her two brothers are at war and Polynices they kill each other and Polynices' body, by order of Creon, her uncle, i.e. Jocasta's brother, has been left to rot. And the dogs are eating it and the birds are pecking it. And you, 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 she, Poly, he, he, can't, he can't progress unless the proper ritual has been performed. His spirit will roam the earth. He cannot go to wherever he needs to go. Hopefully the Elysian fields or possibly Hades. But I mean, he's, he ain't going to go anywhere mm. so, until he's buried. So she buries him, but Creon has said anyone who buries Polynices will die. So she writes it, goes out to bury, gets caught. Uh, yeah, she dies. She, I, technically, she kills herself, but they would have killed her if she hadn't hung herself. Trust me. By, by using her, though, as the voice, as someone who, who knows the, the people that she's describing, obviously, that sort of made it, it, it led it credence in the sense that she also knew the place and she knew the sounds and the smells and that. And I had such, I hadn't expected that I would have such a vivid sense of Thebes. Um, and it made me wonder, I mean, something that we talked about last year was something that um, you had taught me when I was in college. And it was this idea that every, um, every character, no matter how small, you need to sort of know what they had for breakfast and know who their second cousin once removed mm. was. And, um, and I kept thinking, you know, how do you do that in a, in a book that is so set in such a completely different time and place and when there are so many different characters in it? Um, you know, how do you sort of give them each their humanity? And I thought part of that was, again, in the small details that must have been imagined, of course, um, that sounded authentic in Antigone's voice to me. Mm. Um, but, uh, but were tiny things like, uh, also something else I marked, or tiny things like the sounds. There's lots of bird sounds. Um, there's specifically night jars. Um, I loved at one point, there's cows sort of chewing cud. Um, there's, uh, what I loved was the slightly uh, attention to sort of random unnecessary detail. <laughs> like at the very beginning, and this can't, I mean, this must surely have been your own imagining. Um, I think it's when Cadmus is, um, 
uh, he's burying one of his one of the his men that's been eaten by the serpent, mm. and he buries the body, and then he finds an ear and realizes that he forgot the ear, and he puts the places the ear aside to bury later, and then buries it later. Um, surely that was your own. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But all but, the bonkers but, bits but, were but, yours. But the serpent, the serpent, um, whose Mars is um, offspring, is and guards a spring where Cadmus and his um, followers are, are, are hoping to drink. Um, the, the serpent did kill them all um, very violently, and the serpent did keep the heads. So when you know they've kept the heads, from that you start thinking, okay, so you're going to bite the heads off, right? Well, then you think, I mean, you know, if you, yeah, it would be easy to take an ear off. <laughs> to lose an ear on the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, or a nose or something like that. So. Yeah, you have help from these materials. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I, um, Robert Graves' The Greek Myths and L'Ompriere's Classical Dictionary are extraordinary books. Okay, Which yeah. kind of, yeah. Were you working from a particular, I think you did say you were working from a particular translation of... Yeah, yeah, um, the e Whitney or Watney or Watney, I think, yeah. In the, it, it was, it, it was the, um, the version of the play I used was the Penguin classics edited by E. V. Rea. He was the he was the general editor, but he wasn't the translator, although he was a he was a um, a Greek speaker and translator. Um, there was it was someone else, but that was the that was the it was through that translation I encountered the play when I was at school. Okay. Because it's yeah. you know it was like from the twenties or something, or fifties. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it's uh, yeah, and I'm a creature of habit. I mean, there are many new, no doubt, brilliant and excellent translations, but I s stick to the old one because um, I, I can't bear change. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you to read a tiny bit? And um, the bit I'm going to ask you to read, I was obsessed going through this now. My favorite character by far, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong as well, was the Pythia, the Pythia. Oh, <laughs> who the is prophetess. The prophetess. <laughs> um, so I think this is page 175, roughly. I mean, that was, one of, visit, visit that was the one of the few, I mean, all the Pythia. The, the this is tr true. I mean, she really? existed. Oh, yeah. God. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. The Delphic Oracle really was a place. And so the priestesses would be usually married women, usually widowed. Um, yeah. And they would have the gift. And then every... Oh, I don't. Yeah, regularly a, 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 a very important rite would be performed in which they would be bathed and cleansed, and then they would be down in the underneath the temple in a place which allegedly was full of fumes, yes, which, yeah, the, which, which intoxicated them. It has a very them, particular smell. Uh, yeah, sort of gassy, methaney, nasty, swampy, rotten smell, um, and they, you know, they saw the future. Well, the. <laughs> So basically, anytime anyone has a problem, they go to ask the oracle what to do. They can ask her one question, and she sits on this bowl-shaped chair. Yeah, that's real. She's on, on, a, on high legs. On high legs. And wears a, a young girl's dress, even though she's short an old white woman, dress. Yeah. And has like a sprig of laurel leaves or something. Yeah, and a, bowl of, and a bowl of water. <laughs> yeah. And you can ask her anything you want, and she will tell you the truth. Um, yeah, yeah. And sometimes she'll, re <laughs> she'll tell you a lot more. Than you bargain for, um, and she might have been tipped off about the questions beforehand because you'd have given the questions the priest, to the priest. Yes. Okay, I wondered about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there are various accounts of what happened, but no, really existed, and um, was the centre of the culture. There were other oracles, but the Delphic Oracle was the most important because the culture prolongated two ideas which were inscribed over the entrance to the compound. One was um, know thyself, and the other was like the middle path in everything. Mm. Um, but we also have to remember the Delphic Oracle has a dark side. So Aesop went there, and the Delphic priests did not like what he said, because mm -hmm. he criticized them. He ridiculed them. So they planted plate from the oracle, gold plate or silver plate in his baggage, and found it, and he was taken, he was executed. Oh. He, 
he, was, he had the cliff execution, <coughs> taken to the cliff mm -hmm. and thrown off at sunrise. That's what happened to Esau. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was the other passage that I actually had marked that I loved. There's this wonderful passage when um, Antimedes, I am saying this wrong, yep. I? Um, is walked. Uh, because instead of you think, why wouldn't they just execute them within the walls of the city? But they don't. They walk them off away up Mount Fissum, Fissum. Fissum, yeah. Fissum, yeah. and throw them off. <laughs> At dawn. Yeah. At dawn, specifically. Um, Which is also the place where the Sphinx lurked. And she would also, every time you failed to answer the um, uh, riddle, you know, what walks on four legs at the beginning, two legs in the middle, and three at the end. You failed, off you go. Over the cliff and into the sea. Because you see, by doing that, you damned that soul to perpetual torment. The remains could not be reclaimed oh, by the family. this was the reason. Yeah. And this all connects with the very, very famous scene in um, the Iliad where Priam comes to Achilles and begs for Hector's remains, mm. you know, that have been dragged all around the city behind a chariot. Mm. And eventually Achilles, who is learning that rage doesn't work, gives Priam Hector's body. Mm. And apparently that's a seminal moment in European culture. Would you read? This is the oracle part. The oracle. And it's pretty significant misunderstanding that leads to Just the page? Death. Just down to the bottom? Or, um, or over? I think just just over, to wherever you... We, I, I like the description of the oracle is what I'm asking. At the oracle, Oedipus had paid his fees and performed his rites. He had been vetted by the priests and drawn his lot. Now he was sitting and waiting his turn under a canopy, strung up to provide some shade from the boiling sun. He was surrounded by other waiting supplicants. I hate sitting with the question going around and around in my head, said his neighbour, my mind going back with e my mind coming back with every conceivable answer. I'm not thinking now, said Oedipus. I'll do that when I come out. You're a lucky fellow, said his neighbour. Oedipus yawned. I'm just going to close my eyes, he said, if you don't mind. He folded his hands on his lap and let his eyelids droop. Oedipus felt his arm being touched and opened his eyes and looked up and saw a priest with black skin. The priest nodded. Oedipus stood. The priest took him by the hand and led him off. They entered the temple, a relief after the heat outside. Inside was a smell of burnt mutton mixed with a sweet, putrid odour. Oedipus felt strong and certain and sure. He felt his feet moving, taking him forward, one small step after the other. He felt his lungs going up and down as his breath went in and out. Then he descended some steps. The space below was even darker than the temple above. The smell of mutton wasn't so strong, but the putrid, sweet odour was much stronger. There were the drapes, and the priest had one open and was beckoning him through. Oedipus stepped forward and went in, and the priest followed him, and he heard the drape fall behind. He was in an enclosed space lit by brands. There was a smell of burning pitch as well as the other smells. The Pythia, Pythia was on a bowl-shaped seat with three legs. She was old and wore a young girl's short white dress. In one hand, laurel leaves. In the other, a bowl with water in it. The priest bent down and put his mouth to her ear. The Pythia closed her eyes and shuddered as the god entered her. Then she opened her eyes, and the god looked out through her eyes at Oedipus. The priest nodded to Oedipus. He could begin. Am I my father's son? he asked. Yes, of course. You are your father's son, said the god through the Pythia, though you would be right to wish you weren't, because you should also know you will kill your father, and then you will take your father's place in the marriage bed as your mother's second husband. He would? What? <laughs> Um, 
And the, see, the other thing uh, um, I loved about Antigone as a person, as a narrator, which is why I wanted to have her, not anything anonymous like myself, is she makes, as far as she's concerned, when she says the god Hermes, no, sorry, the god Apollo, when she absolutely believes that Apollo enters the Pythia. And when the eyes are looking out, it's the god's eyes. And the Pythia believe that. And Oedipus believes that. And when, at the end of the story, Oedipus hears her father talking, and he says, oh, that's Hermes. He came into me when I was sleeping. Yeah, no problem. Hermes was inside Oedipus's head, telling him his story. And then Hermes's, Hermes's um, explanation of Oedipus's backstory, much of which is unknown to him. He didn't know about Chrysippus, for instance. All of that, unknown to him, passed on to her. It's, it's the truth. You know, so she's a person who, yeah, of course you can have serpents with gold teeth that are planted and turn into men. Well, that was everyone, though, kind of. Yeah, They everyone. were very accepting of that. Yeah. And at the same time, completely in the world and understood how yeah. people behaved. Yeah, yeah. That's... And understood, you know, coldness and poverty and, um, you know, physical truth. So, But at the same time, didn't think it was peculiar when... Uh you know, giant serpents flew down from the sky. Or... No, 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 that, that's, that's absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And I love that. Yeah, uh, you don't believe that? <laughs> I, yeah. I found the whole system very um, uh, appealing, I suppose. Um, the idea of there being, you know, multiple gods, um, and if you angered them, things went badly, and then you could do other things. You know, for example, there are plagues, obviously, mm. very timely. Um, um, timely also to climate change, I found myself thinking of when there's sort of frogs raining down from the sky and, um, and uh, when all the crops are failing. Um, but these were things that happened because the gods had been angered in mm. ancient Greece. Mm. It just seemed like a nice sort of neat way of explaining things. And I, I definitely would love a, a Pythia to just, I mean, how we could have done with a Pythia the last year and a half. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's never. Just yeah. go to the Pythia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but she would have known the truth. <laughs> she would have known the, the truth being. <laughs> well, well, whatever. I don't know what the yes. truth is, but but she would definitely have known the truth. Yeah, she would have told us what to do. Um, and the other thing is, is that as 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 one um, ages, I become you know, I, I loved realistic novels when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I loved Madame Bovary and so on. But I kind of I'm less and less transported by. Re I love re realism, but non-realism like this, which is pure narrative with snakes and gods and whatever, transports me more. And your last three books have been come yeah. from ancient, ancient stories. Yeah, yeah, old material. And um, I've, I remember reading about Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns said of himself, well, I just, I'm not comparing myself with Robbie Burns. It's his idea, by the way, I'm just trying to communicate. He said, well, I just took a few old took a few old tunes and a few old songs and I just sort of, I just knocked them up a bit, was his explanation of his work. So it's this idea of working with what is common. It's in the world around us and you can reshape it and reform it. I and have that sense increasingly that everything is in, in all art forms in a way has surely been done and done. Um, and so it's okay to perhaps not obsess about originality. It's, it's better perhaps to, to make things authentically and if they echo if they echo things that have been done before, that are being doing contemporaneously, then that's okay. That's interesting in itself. But do you think that because you come from an art school background, it's more, your, your culture is more forgiving of that because art looks back and reuses the canon, whereas literature has this obsession with originality? Perhaps so, yeah, perhaps so. Um, yes, I don't, I don't see the... Um, I, I don't see the, the need of it so much, I suppose, in, in literature. Mm. Um, I should, I'm, I think it's about time that I should be opening it up to the floor Just here. tell me what your, the novel that was mentioned. If any way you can think of questions now. What was the, what, <laughs> what I'm was the asking, novel that was mentioned? Yes, the steep, I, this. Um, oh, this is the, yeah, I have a novel coming out next year now. That's and what's very it called? Much, it's called Seven Steeples. Which, Seven Steeples. Which is apparently also the name of a novel that's already been published. By 
Kate O'Brien? Oh. <laughs> no, no, I can't remember the name of the author. It's a book that was published, I think, in the 1950s. I didn't realize this when I was naming my own novels. Yeah. And I believe titles aren't copyright. No, so they're not. Anyway, there's nothing new under the sun, as you've just demonstrated. <laughs> and the novel that originally was called Seven Steeples that was published in the 50s is about a lady, um, a lady minister, I think, a lady, uh, not priest, is the word, vicar, who has seven different parishes. And she cycles around to all her different... Uh, Okay. I, I could completely pluck that. Anyway, that's not mine at all. <laughs> what is yours about? Um, mine is, I suppose, a kind of a companion piece to handiwork. Um, oh. So it was a book that was written simultaneously to, to handiwork being written, and it's sort of like uh, the fictional story in a way. But it's, it's kind of an allegory of my life for the past seven years, or the past couple of years. I suppose it takes place over seven years. Um, but it's not a memoir. No, no, it is fiction. It is a novel, but but it's heavily based in reality, as everything I okay. write is. Um, I have more of a sense of um, uh, more of an urge, I suppose, to tell my own story or the story of the time that I live in, and that's partly out of um, partly out of, I guess, insecurity, feeling that I don't have the confidence to tell other people's stories or to retell the stories from other times. Um, but I know my own small world with absolute authority, you know, so no one can contradict me here. <laughs> right, right. Because all of this stuff, is, it's just there lying around. It's just it's, there. You can, you, it's, it's there for you to take. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, like I say, I think in, in, in art I'm more comfortable with that because um, to make a ship, for example, you're never going to make the first ship that was ever made. Um, so, uh, so you're already retreading ground, and that's kind of okay. Mm. Um, mm. I should open it. I should have opened it to the floor now. If anyone has a question, um, they can shoot their hands up, or I can just keep going. <laughs> um, here. Hi. In the first verse, you talk about the remodeling, retelling the stories from the past. You know, the There's been a lot of it going on the last mm. ten years. Um, Silence of the girl. And then Rick Riordan is doing some piece. And I just wondered why, what, what's happening now that suddenly everyone's gone back to the myths um, and refashioned them and brought them forward for another for a new generation. Is this the frustration and despair that you were talking I about? Think, I, think, <laughs> I think people look around and think we're completely and utterly fucked. But everyone was thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> and so what are we going to do? I mean, the material is, the material is, it's, it's waxy, it's incredibly, yeah. it's incredibly malleable, yeah. and you can make it go in, in, in many different directions, and it, that's one thing about it. Secondly, it has incredible authority, um, it has um, real narrative heft, it is definitely about something. It may not be the something that you really feel comfortable with, but it's something. Um, they're also, you read it and you think, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, Jocasta's knowing and not knowing, for instance, is, you look at, you, 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 you encounter that and then you, if you're me, you think, well, yeah. You know, as Freud said, denial is the most important principle. Um, and you, you know, how you, you we, we, everybody has to live with stuff that they contain. And they don't really spend, pay it a great deal of attention because if they did, it would destroy them. Mm -hmm. They kind of just accommodate it and manage it. And she has to accommodate and manage the most incredible amount of incendiary content and stuff and so forth. That, I, I would say anybody looking at that would think it would connect with their own life because everybody has, mm -hmm. has some of that in their own life. Um, and you read it through the frame, prism of your own life as well, I think. Um, like I say, I was, I was thinking about climate change because yeah. COP22 was going on when I was reading the bit about the frogs or whatever. Um, or I was thinking about you know, the very contemporary things that I'm watching on Netflix or whatever and about how somebody kidnaps somebody and then they get tortured so that someone... And you're like, these, these are the same stories. Um, so you filter them through whatever else is going on in, in your contemporary life, definitely. Yeah. But also they can be a corrective or, I mean, the ancients can be a corrective or a, a rebuke to us mm. because they certainly had an idea about our 
the relationship with the natural world that is um, in some ways superior to ours. Mm. You have to watch it, you have to honour it, you have to fit in with it, and you have to let it be. Mm. So, um, I mean, the Yes, the I frog, love that because the gods are part, yeah. part animal. And the frogs were worshipped. Frogs were very, very important. Yeah, yeah. That and, and so the, the idea that you, if, if you see a lot of frogs moving, migrating, you don't drive your cart over them and kill them. Um, that's true. Mm, yeah. You wouldn't. I've wondered that. I loved that detail. Yeah, yeah they all have wouldn't. to stop the carriages at some point and get out and move the frogs from the road before mm. they can go on. And the frogs just keep coming and keep oh, going. Yeah, now, that's <laughs> probably an exaggeration because I had a kind of biblical exodus of frogs. I mean, because mm -hmm. that's a sign that the world is out of joint. Yeah. But mm -hmm. yes, frogs would have moved around and you mustn't drive over them. I've seen it on something. on, Or maybe crabs. Maybe I'm thinking of crabs. Mm. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that you kill it and take an egg to tell the story. Um, I haven't read, have read your book. I'm definitely going to read it. I'm really interested in it. But I believe it's a defense of Oedipus in that he didn't have choice, really, in his outcome. Like, his fate was decided. This is, this is what I mean. This choice element is what I'm interested in. Antigone, then, was so, like, her story is all about choice. She makes a very determined choice, and she follows it through to the end. So that thing about tragedy and fate and choice, to me, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how you can say about that. The thing is, is that anti, um, what she hope tries to explain about her father is that he asks the wrong question. Am I my father's son? Is the question Which he is asked. the piece, that, the extract that was yeah. read of, here. Of course, mm. the Pythia is going to say, well, who else would you be? Everybody. You, you are your father's son. The question son. was, who is my father? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So he thinks that from having asked the wrong question, that his father is the king of Corinth who has brought him up, and that's the man he's going to kill. The king of Corinth is not his son. It's Laius, the king of Thebes. And he, he's then told what he's told, and he leaves in this, uh, this... He's in a terrible state of confusion because he suddenly believes he's going to kill the father and marry the mother who have brought him up in Corinth because they have not told him. And the red mist is in him, and he meets a carrot. There is a row, and he kills the occupant of the carriage and some of the retainers of the occupant of that carriage, but not the shepherd. If he stopped to think, he would have known, because he's only going to kill one person, and that person is his father. And then he's only going to marry one person, and that person is his mother. If he'd asked a different question, he wouldn't have got into the tangle he gets into, but he gets into the tangle he gets into, and everything that everything follows from that. And nobody really has much choice. No. You know, that struck me because, uh, you know, in the times that we live in now, I think that you know rich people have choices. Money solves all problems, but really, even the most <laughs> highly influential and wealthy people, you know, these are the kings and queens of their time. Um, and they were just as hamstrung by circumstances as the, the tiny players who were at the mercy of their will. And um, so, uh, so, I mean, really, no one had a choice. But I, I mean, I was talking to my wife, or my wife was talking to me yesterday about the um, incredible uh, chemical um, onslaught. I mean, we, we were watching somebody wipe tables because of COVID. Mm. And this led to this conversation about a woman who'd had her blood tested and she had 40 different um, chemicals in her that she'd absorbed from, you know, they were cl household cleaning materials, from foods, from... And, of course, this has happened without our permission. No permission has been given at all. And there are many other things that have happened, often to do with capitalism, for which no permission has been given at all. None. Oh, you cannot clean. <laughs> what? You cannot clean, yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. 
not clean at all. Um, stop washing one's hair. Because, yeah, no. <laughs> oh, God, I don't want to know, do I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I have a sort of a novelty question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> if you could ask the Pythia one question, <laughs> what would it be? Oh, I would ask about my children's lives. Which is mm. what Europa did, more or less. Mm. Um, mm. At the end, yeah, mm. she's interested in the welfare of her children, mm. really. Yeah. Mm. Who are the product of violence? Who, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> in yeah. her uh, case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But she does. That's absolutely mm. right. She does, yeah. She does. Um, I'd ask about my children's lives, our children's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I always think, or Mark and I have a running joke that, um, at the, that came about due to this book and also came about due to us um, uh, watching that documentary on Netflix about um, Ian Bailey. And we live in West Cork as well, so this is perhaps foremost amongst our minds. So the running joke is that if we, if we got to ask the Oracle one question, it would be, who killed Sophie Toscan de Plantier? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Daily drives well, insane. No, no, actually, that would be a very good question to ask. <laughs> yeah, because you'd get a very, very clear answer. Yeah. Carla, yeah. Uh, where can you go after, now that you're, you seem to be going back and back further in terms of your, uh, your literary retellings? Like, where, can you jump again? In, no, I where, think, where next is, I think is what the question, I'm, I'm, really. I think what I'm going to do next, I hope, is I read, um, there's a, an East German writer called Christa Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, so Christa Wolf was born in Mecklenburg, which was then in uh, East Prussia in the 20s, maybe the early 30s. I think she was in the Girls Hitler Youth. Anyway, then the Russians come, so she has to leave and move to East Germany. And um, she became, well, she obviously became a party member, and she wrote a number of novels, including a novel about Cassandra, uh, another person who has an absolutely <laughs> terrible fate, um, you know, is, is, is saved and then is brought and brought back to Greece and murdered. Um, and she was asked, she was a great writer. Uh, not everyone likes her because the, she, uh, allegedly blotted her copybook by working for the Stasi, who then sort of dismissed her because they said she was a bit nebulous and dreamy, while simultaneously being spied upon by the Stasi. But a lot of right-wing writers, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the unification of Germany, kind of said, you know, she's a, you know, yeah, not the right stuff. Anyway, she was asked to write a diary on the 20, covering the 27th of September 1960, World Day designated by Maxime Gorky, World Day. Write a diary of that day. So she did for somebody, some paper. It's Vestia, Prada, I can't remember. But she then kept it up. And she kept it up for 51 years, just that day. So I've been reading these, and they're extraordinary. And I thought, hmm, I'm going to do something similar. Not quite as formal, but I'm going to go back and... I've got lots of diaries, you know, the, the, the equivalent of an artist's notebook, and I'm going to pick a day from each year and um, make something, make a narrative out of it, but only one day of each year. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the first one I thought I'd do, I don't know when I'm going to start, but on, in 1994, on the day the IRA announced their first ceasefire, I... I, I'm working in Belfast and I work, walk into the office and everyone is saying, you know, there's sort of jubilation in the streets, the IRA are calling a ceasefire. But it's the day that I have agreed to go for Homes and Gardens or somebody like that <laughs> to a National Trust house mm. on an island in Loch Ney. Mm -hmm. And I'm driven there by this mad ex-prisoner, loyalist, taxi driver who keeps telling me what he'd like to do to the Fenians. And the news is on, saying the Fenians, and then I'm in this big house, and they're telling me, and then I finally get back to Belfast, and I can hear the shooting in West Belfast as people celebrate, as the IRA celebrates. So I thought, yeah, that's an interesting day. Yes. And if, if I can find 30 of those, 
over yeah, the last 30 I, that, years. That, that, yeah, my question is, were you inclined to write down things that happened on significant days? I had written all that down, yeah, because it was okay, so yeah. weird. Because that's lucky. Yeah, yeah. But I have Those written... could be the busy days where you don't write anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then there are other days when really weird things happen that I made a note. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. would be kind of good thrown into the mix as well. Oh, you mean the non-days when I didn't write anything? Or... No, no, well, the, the days, you know, if you can't get a day, one day every year for something historically significant. Oh, then, pick then... a day when I went for a walk and it Yeah, rained. just pick a day Oh yeah. the whole year. <laughs> yeah, I'll pick a day from the year when nothing happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I would like the nothing happening yeah, as much as the Yeah, and a bull got happening. into the garden or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. put those yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm thinking of doing. A different day for each year. Um, that's what I'm thinking of doing. Um, yeah. That's, I, I think that sounds wonderful. Yeah. That's a, um, a, a, a U-turn, but a, you know, it, it makes sense as well. Oh. It all makes sense. Because I do have all these diaries. Yeah. I mean, I've got yeah. lots and lots of stuff. And then I looked at um, um, Alan Bennett's book, Writing Home, um, and enviously noticed, this is the book that has the lady in the van, um, and other things, enviously noticed that it sold 150,000 copies. Now, admittedly, he is more witty than I am, <laughs> right? There is that. I'm not really a funny writer, but if I can put in a few jokes, mm -hmm. maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll reach the stratosphere like, of 150,000 copies. I think there's definitely a lot of black humour in this, actually, black which you humor. may or may not have intended. <laughs> yes, there's certainly black humour, but there's not Alan Bennett humour. Um, that's what I've got to work on. <laughs> I should. I probably need to draw it to a close now at this stage, do I? Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, for thank Carlo. Thank you and for so Dingo. much, Sarah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>